So as many of you may recall, many, many moons ago and day trips ago as well, we went tripping to this one big city. And rather than try to cram the entire thing into a single day trip, which would be like drinking out of a fire hose, we decided to break it up into smaller pieces. Back then we took you south, but we're about to spin that compass and take you in a whole new direction because we're back in our capital city. Austin! Eastside! This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. Being the Texas capital, most should know that Austin is right about here, pretty close to the center of Texas. And whether you're coming from San Antonio, Dallas, Houston, or even out west, in a way, all roads lead to Austin. Well, as long as you don't like take a wrong turn or anything. Austin is known for many things. Music, politics, football, Willie Nelson, and weirdness. And despite all the things Austin can be to all sorts of people, we're only exploring one side of that, and that's the east side. But as you'll see, east can be anything. I tell you, like the east side of Austin just has its own sort of flavor. Look at some of these old houses and all the color on these buildings. Like, I feel like there's a mural on every blank wall. Like every time I'm over here, I find like at least a dozen new businesses. It's crazy. Now I don't know when the last time you crossed over I-35 was, but even if it was yesterday, this place has already changed. And right there with the trend of bringing new to the old is Kube Coffee Bar, occupying an old manufacturing warehouse. Mike. Hey, Chet. Good to see you, brother. Too, man. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. You may remember owner Mike McKim from the time we visited Kuve's roasting house in Spicewood. And while a coffee shop in East Austin per se is nothing new, Kuve ain't exactly your average Joe. First off, there's no Wi-Fi here, so that people will actually talk to people. And for my second point, I've got three words. Nitro cold brew. Uh, you know, let's go with the black and blue. Can we get black, black and blue, blue, please? Yeah. So cold brewed coffee? Yes, sir. A lot of people don't know, nitro cold brew invented right here in Austin. Cold brewed coffee yeah. instead of hot brewed. Uh -huh. And then we infuse the coffee with nitrogen, and then we keg it, and we can it. The end result of Cuvée's black and blue is a draft cup of coffee unlike anything you've seen or sipped. Look at the bubbles in this. Yeah. It is bubbling just like a Guinness going yep. up. Yep. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Oh, that's good, sir. Man, this is this is great. I mean, it's kind of nice to have something cold. I mean, with the it's already 90 something degrees outside. Yeah. Like coffee should just be hot. Yeah. Is it an alternative to beer? Yeah, uh, you know what, I think it fills a really good non-alcoholic space because you can come in here, order a beer, I can come in here and order a black and blue and kind of feel like I'm drinking a beer. Absolutely. Cuvée's got plenty of beer too. Mike put this store on the front lines of growth in East Austin, and I want to know why. I just totally fell in love with the East Side of Austin. To me, it feels like there's this energy yeah. Uh, you know, excitement about the growth versus, you know, uh, we don't want to grow anymore type of thing. Uh-huh. I get the vibe that here in East Austin is like a regrowth, that it's not so much sprawl, we're repurposing stuff. There's bars, there's restaurants, you know, there's daytime energy, there's nighttime energy, and there's pretty much everything that you could imagine over here. Cheers to that. Now with all this rapid growth, some folks complain that Austin is losing its signature weirdness. And while I can definitely see where they're coming from, if you look in the right places, Austin is as weird as ever. This is one of those places uh, that you don't find on tourist brochures. You have to go to like the 10th or 12th page of Google results. You finally find this place when you Google museums in Austin. I present to you the Museum of Natural and Artificial Ephemerata, located in the home of curators Scott and Jen. Well, welcome to the Museum of Ephemerata, where you have been all along. <laughs> I thought I just walked in. But okay, so first off, what is ephemerata exactly? Something with a lifetime, a cut flower, even us. It's an homage to the dime museums of old, where you were never quite sure what you may find inside. 
Marilyn Monroe's Last Smoke Cigarette with the telltale red lipstick. It was rescued from the trash by Mr. Atwick, who serviced her hotel room. Elvis hair on loan from Graceland. <laughs> And even Willie Nelson's hair, you may need this magnifying oh. glass. It's strung from top to bottom. And even though we promised not to, we couldn't resist doing a DNA sequencing so we can create future Willies. <laughs> <laughs> Once the technology is here, he can live on. And it only gets stranger from there. Here we have a human horn. That's a pygmy kangaroo. This ostrich egg. A taxidermied pink flamingo head. Anachronistic cutlery. And that's because the spoon is very new, but the crystals are very old. So it challenges the idea of linear time. Weird. Part of this feels like a social experiment on how much Jin and Scott can make visitors believe. But part of it is just really cool history about museums and the things that fascinate us. And the first public museum opened up in 1789 in Philadelphia, and this is a doorknob from Charles Peel's museum. Well, the first Ferris wheel was built for the 1893 Chicago Fair. They uh, moved it to St. Louis for the 1904 fair, and then they just blew it up. That's how we got those three rivets there. The entire tour is filled with relics and stories. Frankly, I don't know if any of it's true, but I know I like it. So we also have a Yeti toy. And have you ever heard of Rabbi Afrim Kamar? Sure, yeah, but tell me about him again. Okay, yeah. well she... Oh, she, oh okay. yeah, yeah, right, uh, right. She was a custodian at a British colonial outpost in Kabar, India in the 20s. There she encountered a Yeti family, befriended them, and when it was time for them to head north for the summer, they bequeathed a token of friendship to her. We have had this analyzed as an unknown animal's saliva and matted fur. Sometimes there just aren't words, but here's one jackalope. And here's two, Norwal tooth. It is all ephemerata. We are all just ephemerata. And I'm really tripping here, pun intended. So over here, we have a decapitated head of a deceased travel show host brought to us from the future. It's now in our permanent collection. You may recognize it yet. <gasps> Welcome to the Museum of Ephemerata, where you have been all along. Where you have been all along. Welcome. Where you have been all along. 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 I am Ephemerata! You know, the harsh truth is, we all are. None of us are here to last. And the thing about day trips is, they don't last either. So we better keep moving. Now, among all the things catching on in East Austin is this burning sense of localness. Shop local, drink local, even veggie local, which is where Boggy Creek Farm comes in. One of the first commercial urban farms in America, and this is its owner, Carol Ann, who's sweeter than a summer tomato. This stuff looks awesome. Tomatoes? Yes, this is Lemon Boy, All-American Winter, 1977. You guys have a lot of things that you can't find at the normal grocery well, store. Well, we do, and we don't have things they have in every season. Okay, they always sure. have tomatoes, but that's good for you. Yeah. To, to eat something while it's here, while it's fresh. And that's all they have here. Fresh, seasonal, local, delicious. Now, is this a, is this a come, taste, touch kind of place? You can if do you that. Want? You can do that. Oh, I'm going right, to do this one see. here? I want to see if it's hot. <laughs> Good. Oh, good. It's not good hot. Then, yeah. Uh, so typically you don't eat these raw like that. I just, oh. I just want to see you just do just it. <laughs> Thanks. It's all right. Pretty much everything here is safe enough to eat straight off the vine. Okra, figs, you name it. Carol and her husband started this farm over 30 years ago on land that's pretty much been a farm since the Republic of Texas. They've got acres of veggies and most importantly, a love for their work. But on a beautiful day, you know, people come and they'll walk around the farm, the kids and everything. And it's, mm -hmm. You know, it's beautiful. This is baby arugula. You gotta taste this. Now this will this will light you up. I can, I can eat it right here. Eat it. <laughs> Whoa! That's burning like a pepper. Yeah. Yes. yes. Arugula. Baby arugula. Try some. Mm -hmm. And those are the same thing. They're gonna be real sparky too. Caroline, thank you so much. I'm definitely gonna buy some veggies to go, but for lunch, I'm gonna need some meat. Now there was a day when all meat was local. All you had to do was walk to the corner and see your friendly neighborhood butcher. And they could get you any cut you could imagine. Hi. What can I do you for? Bottom round roast with the fatless on the stubby side and a dangle on the top, please. Come and ride up. <laughs> ah. May I help you? Two times 
chop sirloins, please. Leave the lean on the long and the fat on the flank. No problem. There was none more skilled in the art of butchery than your neighborhood butcher. Local and friendly. Perfect. But definitely not. Yes, sir. Vegan. Vegan wheat germ tofu, please. I beg your pardon. Vegan wheat germ. Ah! Meat was their art form. And while most neighborhood butchers have gone the way of the buffalo, there's one shop here on the east side that's keeping the tradition alive. With the help of a little salt and time. This place is part modern butcher shop, part salumeria, and part restaurant. And if you ever wanted to know how your food was prepared, well, just sit back and enjoy. Our whole business model is based on transparency. We have this big, beautiful cutting room. See, I like, I like how you call this beautiful because yeah. the, the idea of like watching hogs get ripped apart with yeah. chainsaws to us yeah. is beautiful. It is. You know, we like to joke that you would still eat our sausage after seeing how it's made. <laughs> yeah. This has been founder and co-owner. Salt and Time started at the farmer's market peddling salami, which is still at the heart of the business. These are two of those kind of flagship things for us, the pecan salami and the chili and oregano salami. And you know, a lot of restaurants say house made on their menu, but we pretty much leave it off. If, if it's not house made, we're gonna tell you where we Do got, we it, got from. it from. Okay, uh, yes. Everything here is local, including the meat that's swinging through the doors to find itself at the end of co-owner Brian's knife. We got a half of a pig here. Yeah, this right. is our uh, Texas uh, Red Waddle uh, breed pig. Uh, they're raised in Gorman, Texas. This guy was walking around on Monday, knocked in the head on Tuesday, and brought in here on a Wednesday, and be sold by Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> it's nose to tail and everything in the middle. I mean, this man hugs raw meat every day just so we can eat the best stuff possible. Oh, just give it the elbow. Like a wrestling move, the dropping elbow. And I love just letting people see that their dinner actually has a face. <laughs> it's something that give itself to, to sustain us. Mine is looking at me right now from that rack over there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you eat meat, you must realize that it does come from animals. And as a meat eater, I want to learn as much as I can about the process. How many traditional cuts come out of a pig? You know, if we're just talking loin chops and rib chops, you're going to get two out of the loin. You're going to get the belly, what we call a picnic ham, which is which left over out of the shoulder okay. after we pulled the square butt. Not many people would say this, but I'm actually getting hungry back here. <laughs> and what better lunch than a whole platter's worth of charcuterie? And that's just a fancy word for cured meats. Bacon is the starter, but it goes crazy from there. And today I'm building my own board with a little chili pekin salami, copa, summer sausage, and beef pate. The meat itself tastes like unlike any other salami I've had, like cured and dried out just the right way. Yep, great on a sandwich or by itself, yeah. This board is basically a meat theme park for my mouth. So here is the coffee Lomo. Oh. And because you were commenting on the fat on there, I figured you should try this piece a as well. A man after my own heart. There you go. Look, oh. so that fat is just melts to the mouth. It tastes like smoky buttered meat. Yes. You know, the just yeah. So it's usually fun to watch people and their expressions as they try something they haven't ever had before, and they'll sit there for 30 minutes and just savor every bite of it. Oh yeah, yeah I would I too. Love it. And that's exactly how I plan to spend my time. With a little salt, of course. We now interrupt this programming to remind you to like and subscribe. Now back to the road. Oh man, nothing like a good light lunch for day tripping, right? You'll have to forgive me if I just crawl up in the back of this thing and take a nap. Ain't no time for that, because now we're gonna step back in time, into the East Side's past. Among all the new and hip is a rich, deep history, as East has been the cradle of Austin's African American and Hispanic cultures. Some of Austin's most iconic institutions are staples in these changing neighborhoods. Mexican food restaurants like Cisco's and blues joints like Victory Grill. Now, if you keep going back, say, 175 years, well, you'll find the French side of town, specifically the French Legation Museum. It's the oldest home in Austin, built during the Republic of Texas as essentially the French embassy to this sovereign nation. Today, the grounds surrounding the French Legation are a peaceful place of respite in the shadow of downtown. But if you're into both history and serenity in the same place, well, just a few blocks away, you'll find the Texas State Cemetery, one of the best and most overlooked sites in Texas. And while I know cemeteries aren't usual day trip stops, this one is the exception. 
It's a beautiful place to pay respects to some of the most respected Texans of all time, including one who's like a father to me. Wow. Here he is, Stephen F. Austin, the namesake of our capital city, known as the father of Texas. He earned that nickname because it was him who brought the first Anglo settlers to Texas, immigrants who eventually won Texas her independence. And it's a lot because of this guy that we have a Texas to begin with. Walking through this cemetery is like stepping through a who's who of the Lone Star State. Wow, look, here's Barbara Jordan. Barbara Jordan, 28. Barbara Jordan was the first African-American woman from the South to be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. The first I mean, you walk these paths and if you know about Texas history or even the names of our counties, you'll recognize so many names on these tombstones. There are Texas Rangers, governors like Ann Richards, John Connolly. One of Texas's most well-known governors and was in the same limousine as John F. Kennedy when he was assassinated in Dallas. Athletes, artists, soldiers, visionaries. All graves of individuals whose impact has outlived their physical bodies. But it's more than just tombstones. Every grave here tells a story. Josiah Wilbarger. It says this guy lived for 12 years after being scalped. That's one tough dude right there. Probably had to figure out what to do with his hair. Now, as you can imagine, not just anyone can be buried on this hallowed ground. You must have been either an elected official or made a significant contribution to Texas history and culture. And it's still open to those who continue to make history today. This spot marks the grave of American sniper Chris Kyle and Governor Rick Perry. Well, he already has his spot picked out. There's an inscription here reading, history does not make itself, people make history. And as a Texan and lover of this state, I can only hope to honor the history that those who've passed on have laid before me. Now, I might not be a Texas legend worthy of the state cemetery, but rather than focus on death, I'm gonna see what this living body can do fueled on charcuterie and coffee as we head to the deep east and Milo Obstacle Fitness. Hey man. Hey, how's it going? Chef. Milo, pleasure to meet you. A lot of folks come out here to train for obstacle races like the Tough Mudder or the Spartan Race, but others just like the fitness of it. We have 75 acres out here, so three miles of trails, two ponds, a creek. How are these uh, obstacles for the, we'll call it moderately athletic people? <laughs> it's, it's somewhat of a challenge. Challenge, huh? Cue the montage. Rather than do it alone, I got a partner. I like, I can always depend on Brandon to do the stupid stuff with me. <laughs> what do you think? I don't want to make you nervous, <laughs> but when I woke up this morning, I didn't have a beard. <laughs> All right, a little friendly competition, huh? Let the games begin. Hey, a helicopter. Ah! Hey, hey. First come the walls. Four foot, six foot, eight foot, 12 foot? Just like these walls get higher, the obstacles only get harder. <laughs> Each one is basically there to break you down. And part of me already feels broken. Yo, Brandon, I'm coming. I'm calling in Milo. He's an ex-Marine that does 36 hour obstacle races for fun. And he's happy to show people the ropes, so to speak. Can you step on top there, stand up. You could get trained, but sometimes you just gotta cut your losses and move on. I conquered that one, good job. <laughs> These things are hard, but I am having a blast out here. And the more we do, well, I think I might be getting the hang of this. Oh, faster, faster pony, oh, come on. And to think that some races throw a half marathon or more in the middle of the obstacles. Yeah, I'm not signing up for any of those anytime soon. As long as I beat Brandon. Yeah, in your face! That was 0.2 seconds faster! Brandon and I are swapping <laughs> events. This is a big one. <laughs> the learning curve is much steeper on some than others. Ooh, javelin throw. I am Sparta! Oh, yeah! 
Oh. Ah! Wait. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'll be the hunter. You can be the gatherer. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually not totally failing at this. And as an outdoorsman, I gotta say, this is my kind of gym. Oh, the gloves. I still gotta be the gloves. Well, other than the uh, gymnastic rings, I feel like it was a pretty even race. <laughs> <laughs> and if we just discount the javelin throw, you did all right. <laughs> Trash talk is just one of the many reasons you bring a friend. But let's head back into the city, because now that I've burned off some calories, well, I get to put some back on. Austin as a whole has experienced a food truck explosion. One of the top dogs in the biz out here is East Side King. And we're heading to their truck, Tycoon bringing Thai street food here to Texas. Run by who else but a guy named Thai. I'm from Thai, and then my name is Thai. And it <laughs> sounded like funny. Sort of worked. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and then uh, the coon to me is uh, like a brother. Like, ah. Yeah. So. Thai's the brother in spirit to famed Austin chefs Moto and Paul Key, who gave Thai this truck to spread his wings on wheels. This is Clinton, the East Side King chef of cuisine. You eat some of this food, it just kind of takes you by uh, shock, you know? Sure. You know, yeah. it's so spicy, it doesn't hold back. It's, it's almost like addictive. Spicy is king in Thai food, and this Thai has the crown. Word to the wise, this is not Americanized Thai food. I try to make like really authentic, like, the way the taste that I used to, the, my family cooking for me when I'm young. But some of them is part of the Chinese too. Like in Thai, they have Chinatown. Every Chinese food in Chinatown, they have twitched to the Thai taste. Oh. Gonna add the spicy, gonna add the parties, and then, you know, so I bring into two cultures. Two cultures. Yeah. I like it. You bring the spice, you bring the party. So let's party with the house specialty, waterfall pork. So we do a pork shoulder marinade, grilled it, medium. Oh man, that looks good. Uh, tiger fry sauce, red onions, put some mint in it, and then we toss it. Fork for this or is your finger? Like... The best way is finger food. Finger food, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Try it, that's you and me, right here. Okay. Grab a little rice. Oh, the fresh mint, mm -hmm. that chili sauce on that pork. One of the greatest things I've ever eaten. Oh, thank oh you. man. Thank you. Now to eat the rest of the menu. Baguette with some uh, peanut sauce. It's like Thai chips and dip. Oh, dude. And over here, beef Penang curry. Chef Thai said to eat this stuff with my fingers, but this is going to be a dang messy proposition. Am I really supposed to eat this with my fingers? No, not that one. OK. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Like, Thai food is amazing. It's got these great herbal things going with all the fresh herbs. Really high on the spice scale. Woo! And now I see why it's four Bruce Lee's on the spice chart up there. I'm gonna start eating Thai food on every day trip. What a day. They say the only thing certain is change, and that certainly applies to East Austin. It's an area full of such visionary people that it can't help but re-envision itself over and over again. And whether you're into the new side, the old side, the weird side, or the outdoor side, you need to trip to the east side because East Austin will keep changing. All we can do is enjoy the ride. So I'll see all y'all out on the road. Bye con Dios, amigos. Ooh, chicken? A little chili sauce, yeah. The I-35 has been the dividing line for all intents and purposes. Perfect purposes? Purposes. <laughs> You know, it's crazy to think that when the Mexicans allowed him to bring the Anglo, 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 Anglo? Let me try that again. We'll get, we'll cut in with something else. Yeah. Make me look cool, Richie, all right? Because I'm not going to look naturally cool on a lot of these. All right, boys, all right man. Let's try it then. <laughs> uh, this is the Mu Wan candy pork belly special. Wait, more food? Yes. <laughs> this is the Thai fried chicken. Uh, this is the Kamen Guy. Holy smokes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You guys aren't hungry, are you? Uh, hey, sorry, you I'll know, just eat all of it. Here's the thing, if you need help, <laughs> I'll be glad to step in. Todd, how about you? Oh yeah, uh, I'm eating this stuff. I'll let you know after I, after I finish it if I've got any left for you guys. <laughs> Howdy y'all, follow along with my adventures at Chet Tripper on Instagram and at the Day Tripper TV on Facebook and YouTube. Or head to thedaytripper.com for travel guides, past episodes, and info on our mobile app and Team Day Tripper. 
This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. Howdy y'all, Chet the Day Tripper here. Thanks so much for tripping with us. Uh, remember, while you're here, like this video, subscribe to our channel so that we can stay out there on the road and keep on tripping. <laughs> Did we miss anything in this town? Leave us a comment, let us know. We love finding out about new stops with all your tips. And if you love Epic Texas Day Trips, remember to check our channel. We got a lot of them on there. Also, don't forget, if you want some sweet Day Tripper merch or another cool Texas-made product, Come see us in Georgetown at the Day Tripper World Headquarters. You can also shop online if you check the link down there in the caption. All right, y'all. Bye, Condios, amigos.